It has been said that the Roman Empire ran on olive oil. Does that sound funny? The Roman Empire ran on olive oil. It was used in their cooking, in their bathing, in their medicine. Olive oil was used in their worship. It was used in their lamps. It was used in their cosmetics. For decades, olive oil from southern Spain was shipped to Rome in large clay jugs. These, these clay jugs were so large they held 18 uh, gallons of olive oil each in them. And the jugs were not worth sending back to Spain to refill, and so they were discarded in a growing heap of shards known as, as Monte Testaccio. And there's a picture on the screen. Do you see that building there in the foreground? In the background, that is Mount Testaccio. That is uh, a pile of broken pottery. The fragments of an estimated 25 million of these clay jugs created that man-made hill which stands today on the bank of the Tiber River in Rome. That's a lot of junk there. That's a lot of broken pots. In the ancient world, the value of those pots as they were coming into Rome was not in their beauty, but it was in their contents. They were very valuable. Olive oil ran Rome. And because of this, first century followers of Christ would have clearly understood the Apostle Paul's illustration in today's passage of every Christian carrying the gospel message when Paul said in verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Our bodies, like those, those clay jugs that held that olive oil in ancient Rome, our bodies are temporary, they're fragile, and they're expendable. But as believers, we are vessels of a treasure of ultimate value, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning, as we examine 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going, to, we're going to see the pressures of being ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to see the weakness that we bring to this ministry. We're going to see where the strength comes from for this ministry. And we're going to see how we can carry the truth of the gospel to the world. But let me start by, by just reminding you that if you're a Christian you're a minister of the gospel. That the ministry is just not, it's not just for paid professionals. If you're a Christian, you're a minister of the gospel. The Bible makes it clear that when you called God, when you called on God and God made you his child, he also made you his servant. When you called on God and he brought you into his family, he also gave you a mission. He gave you a purpose. You who have asked Jesus to be your Savior, you've not only been reconciled to God, but you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Let me read for you from 2 Corinthians. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So not only have you been forgiven, but God has charged you to go out and share that message with others. You have been given this ministry. And you who have committed yourselves to being disciples of Jesus, you have not only been called to follow Jesus, but you've been called to make disciples of other people so they can follow Jesus as well. Listen to Matthew 28. 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples. And finally, you who have crowned Jesus as your sovereign king, you have also been made ambassadors for this king. And your job is to represent him to the world. Again, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We're told, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though we were, he were making his appeal through us. 
So if you're a Christian, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation to go out and help reconcile people to God. If you're a Christian, you have been given the ministry of going and making disciples of all nations. If you're a Christian, you have been called to be ambassadors for Christ in this world, to represent Christ to a lost world. So if you're a Christian, you're a minister. If you're a believer, then being a minister of the gospel of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ is not an option. All Christians are ministers. All are called to make disciples, not just the spiritual elite, not just the paid professionals. All of us are called as Christians to be ambassadors, to represent Christ to the world. And Paul is talking about your ministry here in our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And Paul is being very honest with you about your ministry. When Paul says that your ministry is hard. You've got the ministry of reconciliation. You've called to make disciples. You're called to be ambassadors for Christ. Paul says it's demanding. It's overwhelming. It's very hard to forgive others when they've hurt you. It's very hard to, to share the truth of the gospel when, when you're nervous or shy. And Paul describes your ministry starting in verse 8. If, you're, if you've got the passage open, you can see. Paul says this about your ministry. He says, you will be hard-pressed on every side. You will be perplexed. You will be persecuted. And you will be struck down. Paul is telling us in, in these verses that being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is demanding. Whether you teach the Bible to children or to adults, it's demanding. Whether you're seeking the salvation of a friend or you're nurturing a new Christian, ministry is demanding. Whether you're the leader of a small group or you're seeking to be a witness at work in a difficult circumstance, ministry is demanding. Ministry brings hardships and troubles and frustrations. Being a minister of the gospel brings mental and physical and spiritual and emotional weariness. We get tired. Whether it's teaching Sunday school every week for years or checking on an elderly neighbor regularly or seeking the salvation of a family member over decades, ministry is exhausting. It's tiring. And in the next year and years, um, the ministries that we've been called to are just going to become harder. Over the next year, as we build a new addition, we're going to be cramped for space initially as we lose the houses. And then as the, the um, uh, new addition is transformed, and we're going to have to work through issues with his kids in Sunday school classes. And it's going to be hard. And then after that building is built, we're going to have a whole new set of problems as we seek to use that new tool to reach out to the community. Ministry is going to be hard. It's going to be demanding. But in the middle of our weariness, as the demands of ministry never seem to stop, we need to make sure that we don't lose heart. I was talking to a man in our church recently who's struggling to be a witness and a minister at work. And he's sharing with a non-Christian friend at work. And he shares with him regularly. And the non-Christian friend comes to him almost every day for advice on situations in his life. And the Christian friend's friend gives godly advice and godly wisdom on how this non-Christian, the decisions he should make. And almost every time, the non-Christian does just exactly the opposite. And almost every time, he gets himself into a world of trouble. And then he comes back to the Christian for help. And the Christian has to spend extra time and extra energy away from his family to help sort through this man's problems. And this man is tired of it. And he's tired of ministering. And he wants to quit. 